For the next session, we have Mr. Ranjit Hoskote, who's a popular Indian poet. The session is titled, My Name is Ocean, History, Memory, and Poetry, which is also the title of one of his poems from his book, Jonah Vale, also the topic of discussion for the session. In three beautiful movements, Jonah Vale takes on current themes in its playful, mostly aquatic scope, moving from the ocean to the river Ganga to Bombay's marine drive waterfront. At the heart of the rich, wide-ranging canvas, Hoskote puts into, the, into play the idea of cultural conf confluence. The session will be chaired by Ajinkya Deshmukh. Ajinkya is a research associate working with the Clillet India Project at Manipal Academy of Higher Education. He studied journalism and philosophy and briefly worked for a development nonprofit organization. He describes himself as an academic nomad, that he has lived a geographically nomadic life over the last 15 years. He says is purely coincidental. With this, I would invite both Mr. Ranjit Hoskote and Ajinkya Deshmukh on stage. Thank you, Priya. So, okay, here we are. Um, the way we'll do this is, uh, I'll just give you a brief introduction of Ranjit. Um, then he will have some opening remarks, uh, especially on the theme of Milab this year, a Millennium Revisited. Um, following which we'll probably do uh, a Q&A, discuss his poems, uh, maybe read a few uh, poems that he thinks are representational of the collection. Fi and at the end, of course, we'll have some audience questions. So Ranjit uh, is a poet, art critic, cultural theorist, and an independent curator. He's the author of five major books of poems, including most recently Central Time and Vanishing Acts. Um, Ranjit has also translated the 14th century Kashmiri mystic poet Lal Ded under the title I Lalla, the poems of Lal Ded. His own, own poetry has been translated into German and has appeared in several anthologies of uh, contemporary Indian poetry. His work as a cultural theorist, uh, and that will be relevant to this discussion uh, of Milab, uh, has addressed the post-colonial condition through the lens of globalization. His writing has resisted the, the sort of weighty either orism of binary categories without falling prey to the lazy whatever goes of uh, pop um, postmodernism. So we will discuss today uh, his book of poems and also his views on the theme of Milab this year. So over to you, Ranjit. Thanks so much, Ajinkya, for your generous uh, words of introduction. And uh, I also do want to thank the organizers of Milab for this lovely opportunity to be in Manipal, where I haven't been in 39 years. <laughs> it was last year as a 10-year-old boy. Um, and because I belong to an ethnic micro-minority, I have very strong ancestral links, not to one, but to three different homelands, to Kashmir, to Goa, and to coastal Karnataka. But of the three, I have to say it's Kashmir and Goa that I've self-identified with and have been engaged with closely. And coastal Karnataka is a horizon that I have great emotional attachment to, but I've hardly ever been here. So this is wonderful. It's to be here. And um, also, I would welcome this opportunity. Let me first say that uh, it's a very difficult act to follow Atamjit Singh Ji's um, act, so to speak. The depth of his uh, experiences, his wisdom, everything that he said, which speaks to the transcultural, the tragic condition that many of us have inherited or address. Uh, is something that I hope will inform some of my remarks as well. But it's it's absolutely wonderful to have to have had that uh, talk go before our discussion here. Uh, so I want to also talk about this uh, millennium as briefly as it's possible, because it's a um, it's a millennium that has served as a cultural battleground today. It, it's a millennium, and I'm thinking really of a 1,000 to 2,000 roughly. Uh, AD. It is used by a very influential but misguided ideology to serve as a platform for all kinds of resentments that many of us are encouraged to harbor. We're asked to look at this millennium as a millennium of subjugation, of insecurity, of defensiveness. And the tragedy with that way of looking at this millennium is that we forget everything that was most robust and vigorous and marvelous and culturally productive 
that happened in South Asia. So when I think of this millennium as a past, I immediately begin to see that the notion of a past as a singular thing is a big mistake. There is no singular past. There always are pasts. So when I think of this millennium, I always think of the pasts in the plural. And if you ask yourselves why this prop proposition is not as strange as it seems, you'll have your own answer. The past as it appears to a savarna is not identical to the past as it appears to a person of Dalit background, to a Bahujan, to a Brahmin. When they think about this millennium, they're thinking of very, very different things. To one person, it might be a past of scriptural prestige. To another person, it's an inheritance of oppression. So already, we are looking at the past as something that we need to discuss from different points of view. So any perspective that tells you that there is one way of looking at the past is inherently dangerous and false. Also, I would say that uh, we are not simply linked to one place, necessarily. The more closely you look at India, for instance, you will find that it has always existed in encounter with other cultures, other societies, through the trade circulations of the Indian Ocean, through the Silk Route, through the opening up to Southeast Asia. There's, in every century in this millennium we are talking about, there have been possibilities of openness, there have been possibilities of hybridity, which for me is a good word, and the tragedy with looking at this millennium only through the perspective of invasion closes our minds off. It closes our imaginations to everything else that happened in terms of literary production, in terms of new languages that were created in the subcontinent. And I'm going to give you a very brief example. Let's go back to 1000. Let's go back to 1000 AD. This very influential ideology that I talked about will harp on and on about the attacks of Muhammad of Ghazna, Muhammad Ghazni. And this apparently is said to have brought the subcontinent to its knees in some way. What they won't tell you is that in those same years, the Cholas sent out a fleet to Southeast Asia, which marked a whole different chapter in a cultural interface with Southeast Asia. Uh, and I'm not even going to use this idea of a country because this is not a country we are looking at. We are looking at a cultural formation. So it's a question of where you look in this millennium and what you choose to emphasize. Yeah? So these are, these are things I have lived with for a very long time. So they're not merely academic preoccupations for me. They inform the poetry that I write. They inform my research interests. And they all emerge from this if you will, existential, experiential sense of never having seen myself as being boxed into some single identity. It's the, the, this ethnic history that I spoke about when I opened commits me already to being in a variety of languages. It commits me to a history that is trans-regional. It also commits me to a certain suspicion of closed, singular, boxed-in identities. And the tragic, I keep saying tragic, but it is because I'm completely seized by the sense of what has gone wrong with our notions of modernity. The kind of nation state that we have imagined for, for ourselves has constrained our imagination in many ways. I think it was, a, for instance, a people, I mean, I'm sure there are friends and colleagues here who will contradict me on this and object to what I'm saying, but I think the, the, the creation of linguistic states, for instance, was an error of massive proportions. Because what it did was to tie people in to a linguistic identity which was created in an exclusionary manner. And when I think back to before the linguistic states, think in fact about this state, it was nourished by a variety of linguistic and cultural experiences. And I think back to something that Jayant Kaikini once told me. Uh, he identified three major writers in Canada and asked me to look carefully at what their influences were. Masti Venkatesh Iyengar, uh, Bendre, and Girish Karnad. And he said that in each case, the home language of these writers was not in fact Canada. Uh, Tamil for one, Marathi for another, Konkani for the third. So the impress of the home language, as well as everything that they gained in terms of their encounter with other cultures, including Europe, informed what they wrote in Canada. So when people claim that a language is unique in itself, they actually diminish 
its own capacities for experimentation, for absorption. And this is as true of Kannada as it is of Marathi or Tamil or Bengali or indeed Angrezi, I was going to say, if you want to give the language I write in a more Indian sounding name. I think all of us as linguistic practitioners, as linguistic subjectivities, gain from interface of this kind. And that too is something that when we get to talking about Jonah Whale, you have to stop me at some point, Ajinkya, because I can babble on indefinitely. So this is, uh, th this, to me, it's becoming increasingly clear that the only way to be a, a lingual subjectivity is to be interlingual. And that is one of the great strengths of South Asia. We've always, and I think here of Sheldon Pollock's amazing book, uh, The Language of the Gods in the World of Men, where he talks about how the notion of a mother tongue is essentially a Western romantic idea. There is no word for mother tongue in any Indian language before the encounter with European romantic civilization. Matrabhasha is a formation base, it's a translation of an English term. It's, it has not had much meaning for South Asians because many, many South Asians across this millennium have had multiple first language abilities. And wherever you look, in any part of South Asia across this millennium, you have people who are at home in several languages, who write in several languages. Yeah? So that's part of what I regard from this millennium as my heritage as a writer today. So I also want to briefly talk about the importance of something I'm coming to think of increasingly as anamnesia. Uh, anamnesia is, to me, a way of recovering memories, cultural memories, collective memories that have either been erased or suppressed in some ways. And I think that that's one of our responsibilities as writers, to recover these elements of the, of the pasts. And I, I like the word anamnesia rather than simply remembering because anamnesia includes its opposite, amnesia. So it's an active engagement with memory but also forgetting. So you're addressing trauma, you're addressing the fugue, the possibility that something has been edited out of your memory. You're also thinking of different forms of retrieval. So the challenge then for you as someone working with, for me, working with poetry, and I see poetry as an artisanal practice. It's something you put together. For me, I've always seen it as something like handcraft. Then it's an active form of looking for materials, putting them together, and looking at the contradictions and the lacunae that still remain. Yeah, so I'm going to leave it at that, and then we can talk further, and then we could read from the book. Yeah. So um, you are against this sort of a prescriptive politics of identity, and, and uh, this past millennium is... Uh, has it has been especially detrimental because uh, one, of course, you've mentioned the nation state being this primary unit of geopolitical identity. And on the other hand, the printed word uh, sort of uh, ate into what, what you've mentioned, referred to somewhere else as the latitude of orality, yeah. which allowed uh, for movement, for re reinterpretation. Um, so putting that on one side, there's also, no matter what field of human endeavor we are in, uh, there is an urge uh, from some streak of sort of nativist, uh, uh, you know, prescription where uh, you, someone wants to control legitimacy uh, of what goes as a valid identity and what does not go as valid. Do you think the persistence of that nativist urge across disciplines, across time, I would say, uh, hints to some form of innate human nature that you, one wants to control in some sense? what's valid, uh, what should be recognized as, uh, you know, valid identity and so on. It might not take the form of linguistic identity or geopolitical nation state identity, but some form of identity. Do you think it's an innate human nature then? I'm, I tend to be suspicious of ideas of things that are innate, because that suggests a determinism that one might not be able to change in any significant way. But uh, just to sketch this out, I think the millennium in itself was incredibly rich, incredibly hybrid, incredibly plural. It is our way of looking at it through a 19th century prism that has been detrimental. And it's that heritage, you know, the more I think about nativism, the more I lament the fact that it's actually a bunch of secondhand Western ideas that parade as a search for authenticity. And this is tragic. There might be, a, I say tragic again, um, a certain kind of nativism, if one were to look at it sympathetically, 
would be a legitimate response to the kinds of epistemological oppression that a colonial regime can produce. You want to fall back on something that you feel is uniquely your own, a ground of authenticity from which to oppose the, the more powerful other. But if that strategy outlives its moment, then it becomes oppressive in its own right. And I think, that's, I think we need to see nativism in that kind of context. It's not to diminish uh, certain early triumphs that a nativist point of view might have uh, brought about. Yeah, but it's just to see that it's a strategy that might have outlived its time. So that, to me, is a question. It also really blinds one to the kinds of confluences. This is another key word that I find very, very useful and that actually informs a lot of my work. We tend, because we become committed to binary notions of self and other, we then read that back across our history. One of my favorite themes, again, I had mentioned Mahmoud of Ghazna when I began, uh, cast in the most demonic possible light, and I'm not saying he was a saint. I'm only asking you to look at his coins. If you look at the coins that Mahmoud Ghazni put out, you will find that if you turn them around on the other side, there is an inscription in the Sharda script. And this is the inscription. Avyaktam ekam, Muhammad avatar, Nripati Mahmoud. Yeah, there are three terms to that. And the first two terms are actually the Kalima in Sanskrit. Yeah? Avyaktam ekam is there is no God but one God. There is only one God. Mahmoud avatar, Muhammad avatar is Muhammad is the avatar. And this I find extremely intriguing because there is no concept of avatar in Islam, as you know. Uh, the prophet is the messenger. But what you're seeing in, that, in those two words is a complex process of cultural dialogue. Uh, what happens when you have this Turkic ruler who wishes to mint coins, uh, make, make, make the legend on those coins explicit to the, the new subjects who collaborate in a way in this project? What also happens is a shift in theological register. So something that is technically heresy in Islam gets put on the coin of a Muslim leader because he has to make that adjustment to understand that a Devaduta is not a very powerful figure in, in, a, in a Brahminical context. So avatar is something that is put in its place. It seems like an extremely small thing. This is a little coin. But by it hangs a much larger story of dialogue, of adjustment, of recalibration, uh, and eventually the, the large scale shifts in paradigms. You know? So, um this idea of the nativist ideology outliving its usefulness uh, ties in well with uh, the previous session which spoke about alienation of uh, diasporic uh, societies. Um, when it has outlived its usefulness, uh, we fall back into that same primeval need for belonging and uh, finding one's roots, uh, so, so to speak. And in the absence of this dominant other, uh, you know, against which one can't uh, define oneself, um, and also if one is resisting uh, these inherited categories of uh, linguistic and nation states. Uh, to borrow a maritime metaphor, one can feel unmoored and rudderless, right? Um, and so, so where does one go then? Because that sort of explains a lot of the, the current movement to, you know, go back to one's roots because now there is no, uh, you know, the British other left or the, the colonial other left. Um, where does one then find that sense of rootedness or mooring? Another thinker who I found very, very useful in these contexts is uh, the sociologist uh, Zygmunt Bauman. <clears throat> Bauman has this uh, very intriguing metaphor. He talks about liquid modernity, that the time we live in is a time of liquid modernity, where all our previous certitudes and identities and notions of belonging have melted down. So in the absence of that, where do you locate yourself? Where do you find your moorings? One option, as, as Bauman spells it out, is neo-tribalism which is the, the ultimately sinister and exclusionary project of creating a new identity. So you imagine you're going back to a past. There is no past to go back to. As I said, there are pasts. There's no singular past. So what you're really doing is to take up materials from your cultural inheritance and craft them in a certain way. You are effectively inventing a tradition. And that is what leads to conflict to asymmetry, and this is what we're seeing in operation today in this country, for instance, as in indeed many other countries across the world. 
the option, how do you find your moorings, is if you address these questions in terms of equity, justice, you look at, it's, it's a very simple old stoic formulation. Put yourself in the shoes of the other. Release yourself with a certain degree of empathy to other people's predicaments. It's not, a, it's not an exceedingly intellectual recipe at all, but it calls for you to devolve the privilege that you've accumulated, for one thing. But you're also going to say that there are people who, in conditions of great anxiety or lack, are attracted to aggressive ideologies. Again, the point would be that you need to examine this condition for yourself in certain ways. Um, okay, so one question before we move towards Jonah Whale is these rhetorical devices, these sort of semantic reimaginings of neo-tribalism, I find that a double-edged sword because that tool is available for everyone, right? It, it's, it's, it's available uh, to, to, to reimagine nefarious past, it's noxious notions of identity. Um, and, uh, and there is an undeniable urge to be a part of a collective. To, you know, there's a reason why the most hardened extremist would break in solitary. So uh, uh, there is though then no arbiter of uh, benign uh, authenticity, if you will, and uh, sort of violent or malignant authenticity. Is that just a powerful course, that a risk that we must take uh, if you have to go down that route? No, Bauman is not a fan of neo-tribalism. He identifies that actually as a pathology of our times. Liquid modernity is something that provokes this as a guarantee of security, and it's not. So for him, it's not, a, it's, it's not something he celebrates. So that leaves us with the challenge of what to do with ourselves if there are no guarantees of the collective. So the question, to me at least, is why do you need to have this membrane of identity which has an inside that is acceptable to you and an outside that's not? It seems to proceed from grounds of profound insecurity about yourself. If you were actually quite confident about who you were, you didn't, wouldn't need to exclude anybody. Tragically, we another thing we inherit from this very complex millennium with its affirmative and its negative sides is, is a gradually hardened process, a system of asymmetries which we call caste. It seems to, re it seems to, it's premised on the need to exclude and to mark differences that are not healthy. So that's, that's a, a reflex that we certainly need to, to subject to great critical attention. Okay. So um, now we'll move towards, uh, turn to, more to the book. And a, an underlying theme of the book is uh, uh, water and liquid modernity is actually an apt segue. Um, so it's curious that you, choose, you should choose water because uh, since we're talking about history, remembering and amnesia, um, I'll quote the famous movie Shawshank Redemption where uh, you know, Andy Dufresne's character tells Red that after he's done with his prison sentence, he wants to go to the Pacific. And he, uh, and he says, do you know what they say about the Pacific? It's that the Mexicans say about the Pacific, that it has no memory. You know, So ocean is often gone, like one thinks of it, evokes it, it, it as a clean slate, as a new start, you know, sort of, that's where I will settle on a beach somewhere where the past w wouldn't, wouldn't uh, affect me so much. And that you should choose that metaphor, you know, uh, to talk about uh, this, to talk about this kind of anamnesia, to talk about uh, a radical reimagining or re-engaging with the past. What made you choose water? It's interesting you should raise that very, very American notion of the Pacific having no memory. But if you look at all the other people around the Pacific Rim, they have great memories of the Pacific. I mean, to my mind, this is, uh, most of you are far too young to remember this, but if you remember the Contiki expedition of Thor Heyerdahl of long ago, it was an eccentric, flamboyant experiment at one level, but it was a wager on memory, on the memory of voyages made, on, on the way in which water can retain memory, and the fact that you have languages and experiences and communities that you do not belong to, but you need to make the effort to connect with, and, you, and those histories then become explicit. So to me, as someone living in Bombay, the, the ocean has always been a very powerful presence. And it's been a powerful presence for many reasons, not only because it's a, it, it's a basic experience of the sublime, you're taken out of yourself. The ocean has very, very contingent histories for us. It's, it's the way the city was created. The trade, silk, cotton, 
opium, which for centuries, for decades, no one wanted to talk about. Now we do. There's another trade that Bombay certainly took part in, which we, we do not talk about. It was the slave trade. And all this was part of the incredible Indian Ocean circulations, which connected Bombay to the Arab coast, to, uh, to, the, to the East African seaboard. The Zanj, Al Zanj, Zanj Zanzibar, was uh, not only a powerful imaginary for us on the West Coast, it also was a source of very particular material connections. And actually, in a couple of years ago, when there was that unfortunate wave of Afrophobia, which for obscure reasons swept through India, I, just, I actually wrote something about it. I found myself thinking about how we never look at the great African presence in India, particularly in the peninsula. And people who came as various things, as soldiers, as diplomats, as courtiers, some definitely as slaves. So it's, it's another dimension of what I'm talking about, that when, you, when a certain amnesia is forced on you, you forget the connections that you've millennially had with other people, other places, other histories. So Jonah Whale, to me, was definitely one of those moments. I'm just going to annotate these slides briefly because I'm aware of the tyranny of the clock. Uh, these images speak to what I've been calling anamnesia and confluences. So this actually is an Ilkhanid miniature. It's from, uh, it's from early Islamic Iran. And I have it there because when you think of Jonah and the whale, you're essentially thinking of an Old Testament biblical Jewish narrative. But many narratives, allegories, images have multiple lives. And Jonah has a life in the Islamic tradition as Yunus. So this to me is a way also of thinking about how when you name something, you should be aware that that name can be translated, that in translation it has a different meaning, and that there are different kinds of people who can lay claim to a story. And that makes the story more powerful. It doesn't make it weak. Next. That's another Ilkhanid miniature. This one I have because it comes from... Um, the image won't tell you this story, but the back story is that it was commissioned, it's part of an encyclopedia that was commissioned by a Mongol ruler. We heard of the Mongols in Atamjit Singh Ji's presentation. A Mongol ruler who eventually became Christian and then Muslim. And the, the narrative from which this comes was by a, a West Asian Jew who then at some point became Muslim. So it's part of this larger story of circulations. Because when you solidify something and call it Islam or the Islamic world, you become insensitive to the fact that it actually includes a variety of dazzling hybridities, marvelous comings together of people from different knowledge systems, different belief systems, and they all bring into their new religion aspects of where they came from. Yeah, uh, since I'm in the business of handing out bibliographies as I go, I uh, would suggest Shahab Ahmed's amazing book, What is Islam? And one of his propositions is that, suggests that instead of thinking of Islam with a capital I, if you see it with lowercase i as Islams, you would actually have a far more real understanding of the complexity and the internal uh, debates and differences within that system. You know? And I'm saying this quite explicitly because this country has been in the grip of an unfortunate Islamophobia, which rests on ignorance more than anything else. The fact is, you don't know what you're talking about when you decide that the other is dangerous. If you actually engaged with it in some detail, and the converse would be true. I think any system that you set up as the other and wish to demonize, if you look at it with a degree of attention, you'll find that it's as complex as where you come from. That's a detail from an amazing painting by Turner called The Slave Ship. And I've been fascinated by it since I was a child, and its meanings have become more and more clear to me. At some point, you ask yourself, what is my preoccupation with slavery or the destiny of African Americans who are far away in another country? You know, it was John Donne. No man is an island. No person is an island. The fact is that not only can we empathetically reach out to the sufferings of others, this was not diminish us, but also, given how Bombay had its own role in the slave trade, it tells you that these things are really far away. They're actually pretty close home. It's just that you need to see the connections. We are fixated on the Atlantic slave trade. We never look at the Indian Ocean slave trade. 
that's uh, Siddi, Siddi Mubarak Bombay. That was really his name. He, he was brought into Bombay as a slave to a Jain merchant early in the, in the 19th century and um, lived there, made his life there. He, he was enslaved by Arab slavers as a boy. And then as a grown man, the merchant, upon dying, well, he left, he gave him his freedom. So he goes back and uh, then dwells in Mombasa, becomes guide to various ex expeditions, including Burton's expedition and uh, uh, the, the Stanley expedition to the source of the Nile. So he's quite a figure in the world of the exploration of the African continent. And it's incredible that he chooses to name himself after the city where he was enslaved, but also where he acquired this diverse experience of a larger world. That's a map by Piri Reis, who was an Ottoman uh, admiral and uh, cartographer. I have this there because it's also a way of thinking about how knowledge systems are not simply the preserve of some Euro-American ascendancy. We need to be more and more aware that, frankly, whether it was the Ar Arabic, Arab Mediterranean or Iran or China or India or Turkey, all of these places had their own highly complex knowledge systems, and they were as able to look at things that we believe to be the preserve of European modernity. There were modernities elsewhere. And the faster we recognize these multiple modernities, the more effective we will be as citizens of the now. This is a flashback closer to, this, this is an Indo-Greek coin. And again, I have it there because it marks certain moments of confluence. Because it's in these Indo-Greek and these Indo-Bactrian coins that you find the emergence of uh, forms of worship that we believe to have been millennial. We believe that we've had these for 5,000 years. The truth is that it's in some of these coins and in some of these encounters and these interfaces that you have the beginnings, for instance, of the Vasudeva cult which then becomes the Krishna cult. You know, the first images, earliest images of Shiva. So things that we believe that we've had here forever and are uniquely ours actually emerge from dialogue, from cultural improvisation. Earlier this year, I went to Sanchi in, in, uh, in Madhya Pradesh, and I had a particular place that I wanted to visit. It's called the Heliodorus Column. It's, it's a pillar that stands now in the middle of nowhere. But it's the earliest inscription in India where someone describes himself as a Bhagavat, as a follower of Vishnu. And that man is Greek. The first Vaishnav that we know of ever was Greek. And it's not because he embraced a religion that existed before him. He and others like him were the earliest Vaishnavs. Others. This is from the Silk Road. This is from the Orel Stein connect, connect, Collection, which is partly at the National Museum in, in Delhi and partly at the British Museum in London. Uh, again, for me, evidence of these larger circulations and connections that give us truly an expanded sense of identity. The identities we are clinging to now are in identities we invented more or less in the 19th century, and they're very constricted and narrow. If you open yourself up to these, you will give yourself a far more expansive and confident identity. So, um, now it's obvious to us that there is so much that has informed uh, the poetry that has gone into the book. Uh, almost like dauntingly much, right? Uh, because it, when I was reading it, I, I realized, and I was approaching it through, say, a layman's perspective, someone would sort of just pick the book and try to read it. Um, it's, it invites study, it invites scrutiny, it, it rewards some sort of, you know, uh, rigor in its reading. Uh, you can't look closer and there's some hints at something else, you look closer. Are you discouraging these good folks for Not going out all. and buying the book? <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, I was actually going to ask you, what do you think of different ways of approaching poetry? Because the most common refrain one hears is, it's either not for me or I don't get it right. or, you know, something along those lines. So, uh, of course, there's all of this that informs it. How does one not feel overwhelmed and then approach it some, you know, in incrementally rewarding ways? I would simply say that if you trust what is being made in a poem, the word poem comes from poesis, which actually is the making of pots pretty much in ancient Greece. So to me, that's how, that's how I work on these poems. To me, that is of interest. Uh, I don't regard my poems as discourses. It's completely, it's something else. It comes out of processes of 
uh, bricolage, of collage, of sonic effects, things that exceed anything that I could certainly say about them. So for me, I think I trust the sound more than anything else, because you're sculpting in sound as a poet. To me, that is crucial. And everything else that comes after it, comes after it. OK, so uh, I'll ask you one sort of question on craft. It's almost the chicken and egg problem of, uh, of creative writing. Uh, can we go to the next slide? OK, so a poem like this, right? Uh, this is uh, from this book, from Jonah Whale. Gosh, that's me. Yes. Um, now, all the seven islands, of, I mean, of course, references to Bombay. And there's a particular form that this poem takes. The arrangement on page is not obviously accidental. It, it references uh, the alienation, the patching together of uh, lands to form a whole. Now, something like this, the, the reason I ask you it's a chicken egg problem is, does the form come to you before uh, the content, or do you sort of know what you want to write and then sort of, you know, pick a form that does just justice to that essence? You know, as a practitioner, I've never understood the form versus content uh, contradiction. I think that that has, that has an interest for the act of interpretation. But when you're working on it, honestly, it's a set of approximations and experiments on the page. And you are, I mean, at least I am. I mean, I shouldn't presume to speak for everybody. But for me, I'm preoccupied with the shape of the artifact at one level, how sounds resonate against each other. And if you will, my modest project here was just to see if this poem could be made in a way that could be read in different ways, which could throw up a pattern of sense. Maybe it throws up more gaps than it does. But it's designed, and I use that word quite advisedly, to be read in different ways. You can read them as two columns. You can read the poem as two columns. I'm also thinking of how one can embody in the poem. Because speaking of what you said, I didn't answer your question about orality. One of my other cranky problems with modernity, I seem to have many problems with modernity, but uh, there it goes, uh, is that when you move from orality to scribal culture, to print, you, are, you do lose dimensions. You lose dimensions. And orality is able to preserve a variety of penumbras of significance, of meaning, performative moments, which when you... You remember that old-fashioned phrase which no one uses today, something is reduced to print. It, because you do reduce orality to print. You know, print, or print also forces you towards a single authorized authentic version. I talk about that in the introduction to the Laldea translation, where something that formerly existed in oral versions, all of which were legitimate, it becomes a battle over which is most authentic once you have a so-called print edition. Yeah? So to me, this is a way of seeing if I can unmake the tyranny of print and restore something of the voice. You know, this idea of vak, of sforta, vacha, vakya, these, these are fairly crucial things to me. So you can read this poem as two columns or as one or see how it holds up together. So to me, that's, that's what's going on here, yeah. Which gives us the perfect entryway into reading your poems. Um, so maybe... We have time. We have about yeah, five or ten minutes. Okay, okay, since we named this session for this poem, I'll read Ocean. Since there are at least two languages in this poem that are spoken here, I should point out that something that happens in the poem is that um, languages that supposedly have no script are treated here as languages that have script, and I'll maybe annotate that a little later. This is called ocean. In fact, the more closely you look at languages that allegedly have no script, you find that they can be written in five different scripts. So another of my crotchets, by the way, this idea that of pejorating some languages as dialects and so forth. There's no such thing as dialect. Uh, ocean. My name is Ocean. I shall not be contained. My tides spell starting gun and finish line. Afterwards, only shells and scattered roofs will remind you I was there. My combers wash away the roots of trees, towns, the shaken heart, but mortals, there's hope. My breakers hurl seeds back at your shores after the flood. The chroniclers will write in Konkani, Sabir, Aymara, Tulu, Jarawa, Creo, Tok Pisin. After the flood, the beach exploded with giant peacock trees. 
in whose branches on windy days you could hear the surge and swell of ocean summoning whales, whalers who chased blood wakes, red-haired women who fought pirates, sleepless harpooners who sailed from fjordlands to where volcanoes splintered the sleeping ice, furies who choked pearl divers, drove catamarans aground, voyagers who fell into the sea and grew wings, ocean reciting from his depths, every drifting epic of pursuit, every song of shipwreck, every trace of raft and sail and trailing anchor, flotsam, jetsam, buckram, vellum, he could remember. And then I'm going to read a poem called The Refugee Pauses in Flight, which is dedicated to a novelist who've, who's been a long distance mentor to me. And whenever we've met, I've, we've had the most, uh, for me, memorable conversations because he has so much to teach. Uh, this is Nuruddin Farah. Uh, the Refugee Pauses in Flight. Uh, Atamjeet Singhji, you'll be interested in this. He's, he's a Somali novelist who studied in Chandigarh. So The Refugee Pauses in Flight for Nuruddin Farah. What should I call it, this number that has no name? Countries are working hypotheses that sometimes fail. I escape from mine, my wings of flame doused, my route sketched in rumors, an alphabet of stone and diesel tapping at my ribs. Invented reasons found in a drawer of mislaid knives. Never look back, not even at the veined marble columns, the coiling creepers, the rusty sea gate, the orange tree, all that you thought was you. Even the briefest glance over the shoulder could turn you to salt on a photograph. Pick up the key ring, slowed by its bunch of yellowed date tags, where to draw the borders of the occupied city, across brain lobes that sleep while fingers twitch in spasms, across tents that shiver and capsize on a frozen beach, across graves on which the wild basil has grown. Living among strangers, he almost forgot the names of his gods. This is called the Atlas of Lost Beliefs. And it's a list poem, so bear with me as the list unfolds. The Atlas of Lost Beliefs. Without waking up, turn to page 37 in the Atlas of Lost Beliefs and surround yourself with Apsaras, Kinnaras, Gandharvas, Maynards, Satyrs, Sorcerers, Bonobos, Organ Grinders, Stargazers, Gunsmiths, Long Distance Runners, Grave Diggers, Calligraphers, Solitary Reapers, Bean Cars, Troubadours, Rababias, Ronin, Nagas, Pearl Divers, Vandals, Goths, Mummers, Snipers, Collectors of Moths, Hobos, Dharma Bombs, Bowls, Drifters, Jinns, Majubes, Mara Booths, calendars, griots, mad hatters, speakers in tongues, trippers, star angels, batmen, punks, eggheads, buffoons, lay preachers, agitators, friends of the court, friars, minorite, agents provocateurs, bird spangled shamans, fainting oracles, screeching owls, wise men of Gotham, and women who run with wolves, all blessed by the blue hand of a reckless dancer who spares a thought or two for the world, but no more, as she poses, heels in the air, Cossack kicking on a crumbling reef. This one's called Open for Business. So if these poems sometimes address continents and oceans, sometimes they're as quiet and intimate as something that happens in a cafe. Yeah, open for business. Newspaper bunched in hand. You're misting the door with Lysol, wiping the glass panels in wide arcs. But the man in the blue paisley bandana, who's whistling the opening bars of Hansai Bapul 
isn't planning to get scrubbed off the menu. He's pushing through with a crate of eggs, his hands itching for whisk and skillet, the first Spanish omelet of the day. He's the dancer sweet-talking the boatman into getting her across the river. You are a tightrope walker with a limp, nursing a sore throat. You spray the swinging air with soap. I might read just one more. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This one's called After the Story. And again, one of my long-term preoccupations has been how to deal with the great and sometimes debilitating legacy of epic, especially if you're working with either a lyric form or trying to break the lyric, but how to get epic into um, a tight compass. After the story. From the ant hill came the voice. Two white birds perched on a branch, one killed by a hunter's arrow, the first poem written in its blood. The morning sage's sudden curse falls on the hunter's ear as verse. From the ant hill came the voice. Prisoner on the island of his suspicions, Alone under his white silk canopy, he murmurs the chants that his aging priests heap on the fire sacrifice. Then from nowhere, two boys' voices, high flutes above the drone, dropped masks, startled faces. The boys sing. From the ant hill came the voice of the golden deer in the forest, the princess carried off by the demon chief, the war, the siege, the giant red monkey caught wheeling across the sky and burning the island fortress. When the war ends, the prince fixes his wife's 14-year wait with a cold stare and an ordeal by fire. The fire plays honest witness. From the anthill came the voice, but the prince cannot bridge a distance greater than the stormy sea. Doubt again for him, again exile for her, love twisted and beaten on a washerman's stone. At last she will have had enough of his tests. She will ask the furrowed earth to swallow her. He stands up shaking, his eyes opened wide, as his children sing to the king his own story. Thank you. Thank you so much for that reading. Um, and uh, I must reiterate that this is really a book uh, that invites you in. Uh, if you invest the time in it, there are so many details that emerge. Uh, I mean, I had to go back and you know uh, tease out so many references from the book. Uh, we have some time for questions and uh, questions only. So uh, yeah, uh, we. I mean. Uh, we'll take uh, Dr. Atamjit's, uh, you know, measure. We started 10 minutes late, so we have about five minutes to go. Okay, fine. Yeah, Rahul. Thank you for this uh, very scintillating discussion. Uh, keep it short. I'm quite inspired by the uh, slide behind you. <laughs> so I'll keep it really very short. Uh, just as you mentioned, you were um, suspicious you tend to exercise a degree of suspicion about the word innateness, uh, equally suspicious about the word hybridity. Uh, uh, I'm asking this as a question. It's, uh, is, it, uh, is, it, is there something that we need to be also wary about, uh, assuming that hybridity, hybridity is always a form of dialogue? Is there also an inherent risk of it being, uh, uh, you know, like cloaked in a larger political project of sorts. Hmm? Yeah, which is why I, at one point, for obvious reasons, uh, hybridity was a very useful trope. Uh, but it's outlived its usefulness to me, certainly. So I far prefer confluentiality, which seems a little vague. But um, I would load the notion of confluen confluentiality with the kind of agency that's sometimes missing in hybridity. Because hybridity can easily lend itself to some generalized apparatus of including diversity and domesticating it and neutralizing it in some way. I'm far more interested in confluentiality as something that's an ethical project for you, for us, for any of us. 
As we are each of us is a subjectivity that has some agency in this matter. So how do you resist narratives that close you off and narrow you down? How do you embrace multiplicity? And in doing that, you come up both against something that's affirmative, but also you will uncover traumas, you will uncover the fugues of edited memories. Somehow hybridity doesn't seem to allow for all of that. It seems to go immediately into celebration, and we might need to be more cautious. I don't know if that, does that answer? Arvind uh, had a question. Uh, thank you, uh, Ranjit, for such uh, wonderful uh, uh, lecture. I would call it a lecture because uh, you spoke at length. Uh, I also loved the readings. Uh, now I'm going to pick up the poetry book uh, uh, despite Ajinkya's uh, warning. Uh, but I have a question since you're a cultural theorist. I'm not a poet, but I love reading some poetry. Uh, since you're a cultural theorist, I'd like to ask you, uh, once a professor told me, uh, so I teach at the Department of European Studies, I studied in Hyderabad, uh, did a PhD in English literature. So once a, t a teacher told me, uh, the greatest contribution of uh, Enlightenment Europe was the uh, emphasis on reason, uh, you know, using reason to question everything. Uh, where did did this um, faculty of reason, um, did it get submerged in India in the last millennium? Because I hesitate to say that it did not exist, because I don't know. But uh, what do you think about this? I can't phrase this question better. Okay, let me try. I mean, thank you for the very uh, uh, complex question, actually. I would have maybe two or three very approximate responses. For one, even while we need to preserve a certain liberality of attitude, I think there are huge problems with, the li with liberalism as a position. So when we talk about the primacy of reason in an Enlightenment tradition, we're also forgetting that, well, we might not be forgetting this, but the Enlightenment tradition that we so prize was also the ideological justification for a whole variety of extremely dangerous things. I mean, the contractarian philosophy of Locke emerges from there, right? So Akhil Bilgrami, the philosopher, says this marvelously. He said, he asks us to think back to a moment when, when did individuals become, when did communities become citizens? When did nature become resources? You know, these are questions that are worth asking, you know, because they go with this idea of the primacy of reason and the sovereign individual. That might seem to be a very worthwhile aim in itself, but with it goes the mandate to exploit other people, the environment, to feed and sustain this sovereign ego effectively. So I would be a little careful with thinking about questions of reason as solving all problems. It also doesn't address the fact that affect can be a ground for understanding. The sensuous, sensuous, sensuous experience can be. And from that point of view, I'm really not a nativist at all, as is well known. But, um, there are, there are any number of in forms of inquiry in, in India across this millennium and before which attend to these questions. I mean, they attend richly to, to questions of how one might have a holistic experience. And they don't necessarily privilege the sovereign individual. And today, in the age of the Anthropocene, we are looking back, if anything, to see if we might recover techniques of vision from other forms of looking at the world. At the same time, are we going to, you know, how do we deal with questions of constitutionality, for instance? I'm not sure that we can do that without referring to the liberal tradition. So we, are, it's, we have to see this under the sign of dilemma. I don't think there's a simple solution. But we need to certainly be critical of each one of these received uh, legacies. A very good afternoon, sir. Uh, sir, so um, for, for, from a student's perspective, this is something very, very different that I have seen today from the kind of poetry that we are exposed to at campus or we have been exposed to at an academic level back at school. So what I want to know your perception about is, you spoke about two things, about accepting differences in the society and about the structure in which we present our poems and everything. And from the slam poetry culture that is so prominent amongst youngsters these days like us, 
how is that different from the time that you started writing and how has it changed till here and what are your views about it? To be completely fair, I don't think I'm the right person to answer this question because I, I haven't, I mean, there's, I've just attended one slam ever. So I have no preconceptions about it. But what I would simply say is this, I don't, following from what I was saying about orality and scribal culture and print, <clears throat> I don't think there's any sing single way of making poetry. And the slam is, is, it may seem like a new thing now, but it draws on, it, you can derive its origins all the way back into bardic culture, the mehfil, the buzm. There are all manner of, which would of course have been at other levels of competence and the demands they made on participating poets. But the idea of the assembly of poets is, is far from new. The idea of orality is far from new. So I'm not impressed by the kind of discussions that you sometimes hear about page versus stage. It's a non-issue. The same poem can have two different lives on the page and on the stage, or depending on how you perform it. Uh, I mean, I've been spending a lot of time now in the last few years working on the ghazals of Mir Taki Mir. Uh, and the question is, can you even translate a ghazal? Because each of its, I hate that stupid word, couplet, but because it really, it really lowers what is going on in, in, in the poem. But there is a way in which a ghazal in its different elements can fly off in different directions. You can do that when you're performing it. What does it work like on the page? Yeah, these, these challenges have been with us far longer than many slammers believe. So we wrap up, wrap up with that. Thank you so much, Ranjit, uh, for this session. And uh, I think after this, uh, we break for lunch, reassemble here. Any closing remarks? Are we good? Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for your attention.